Thank you. Well, it's lovely to be here and uh, to see some faces I know and also um, to see, well, to know that I'm amongst so many CGS people. I was just mentioning to, um, to one of you uh, as we were just eating some muffins that, in fact, I, because I go between England and America so much, there must be some kind of stockist of CGS materials over here. So those who um, are trying to develop it in England often ask me to bring back with them, uh, you know, sheep and this sort of thing, you know, to, to, to make. <laughs> and my, one of my experiences, which wasn't so pleasant, was when um, I think I had a large paper bag. It was actually the breaking point was I was asked to bring back the city of Jerusalem, I think. <laughs> So I had that in my paper bag, and I, was, and I had some other books in it, and it was, and too many other things in my hands. And as I was going up, what do you call the escalator? Yes. Um, anyway, going up that, if that's the right word. Yeah. Going up the escalator, it broke. And um, so all the bits of Jerusalem and lots of the books just started disappearing down this escalator. And you know, because you, I'm too old to run down the escalator, you know, when it's going up and everything else. And it was absolutely packed at the airport. So it's, uh, everybody was filming me and, you know, as I was trying to collect all the little bits of Jerusalem as they appeared at the top and made sure nothing got lost at that point. So, uh, but I, all, I do admire what you do, those of you in Catechism of the Good Shepherd, so much. I've never had any of the skills needed to actually make any, anything of the sort that's made for this. But I really love the methodology so much. Um, and... I've learned from it a lot as well. What I want to say in this one, it's, it's been called Source and Summit, hasn't it? Which is a lovely title for, for this. Um, I think I'm going to inevitably sort of be gathering some of the things which you've already heard over the last few days. And that's as it should be because um, it's going to be inevitably a little bit autobiographical, what I want to say to you because I have come so far in my own understanding of this topic and I am so aware that I am I'm just nowhere near the point yet where God has said to me what he wants to say about this. So I'll, I'll give you some convictions and where I'm going with it um, and I hope it won't be too scattered but if you like it I'm going to to some extent tell you what I've been discovering from originally a Baptist background in a very, very secular country with a very secular worldview. And that, my own journey through that Baptist background, through an Anglican one to a Catholic one. Are we in Thomas Merton's room? We are, aren't we? Yeah, yeah I went to Gethsemane as part of my, in Kentucky as part of that journey for myself. So, um, so my convictions about this. Um, First of all, the Eucharist really is the source and summit, but understanding what that means for catechesis is incredibly rich and profound and does, re does require we do things in a, in a way that takes that very, very seriously. But it unlocks the understanding of everything we want to do in catechesis once we have that concept. A second thing I really, um, because I, was, I grew up really with the scriptures, so I grew up sola scriptura. I then went through a massive, well, no, it wasn't massive, well, it was, yes, massive, but very extended period of conversion of my mind through reading church documents like Vatican II and the Catechism. And I think what's happening slowly is that I'm realizing the two belong together. But it's, it's taking me a long time to put the two worlds together. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger said that think of the Catechism as an extended reflection on the Scriptures. And I'm only really just beginning to do that so the church teaching the scriptures really do belong together. So if the church says the Eucharist is the source and summit, the scriptures must say that. Right? Otherwise it's not, it wouldn't be a reflection on the scriptures. But have I ever really read the scriptures as the source and about the Eucharist in that sense? I know you've had a, a whole talk I've missed on this. So, uh, so anything I say there... I hope it's, it's worthy of some of the things you've already heard from somebody who's really studied that. But I'll give you some examples of how slow I have been to believe. Right? First of all, the title New Testament. 
I don't know why it doesn't strike a Baptist that the only time Jesus uses that is with reference to the Eucharist. So the whole of the title of the scriptures is the Eucharist. I mean, I don't know why it just doesn't strike. Um, I know that, uh, so therefore, we know that the scriptures are written also from the point of view of the resurrection, after the resurrection, don't we? They're written in the life of the church to reflect upon Christian life in the church. The scriptures, therefore, are mystagogia. The New Testament is a mystagogical text. It is reflecting on what the Eucharist is and what the sacraments are and what the liturgy is. That's most fundamentally what, they, what it's doing. It's taken me such a long time to see that, even though that is what the church says about them. I've, never, I've always read them, I suppose, primarily as historical documents about the life of Jesus rather than about our sacramental life in Christ. So, I'm just, if you can enjoy the sense of somebody slowly reaching points where you say, that's great because that's where my six-year-olds are, you know, in Catechism of the Good Shepherd, then you can realize that I'm, I'm getting there slowly like that. So, for example, I'll give you um, just how things come together. And this is one of the reasons, I, again, I love Catechism of the Good Shepherd, is because it works by insight. It works by the children making the connections themselves. And that is the way in which the Catechism has invited me to see that there's an organic connection between things. You look at them for long enough, then you see it. So, for example, if that's the case, that the Eucharist is the source and summit, that the New Covenant, the New Testament, is about the Eucharist, essentially, about Christ making of the Eucharist, then, okay, how do we understand something like um, Jesus' commissioning of the apostles, the disciples, at the end of Matthew? You see, I think the way I'd understood that, so Jesus meets all his disciples at the end, when he's resurrected, meets them on a mountain, which I hadn't really taken seriously, summit. I'd been very, um, I think I just thought he went, he sent them out to baptize people and to, and to teach. But, you know, so there's two functions in the church. I'd never really pulled it together that it's basically about the Eucharist. One of the, um, often my way of coming to new insights is when people themselves challenge me about what I'm saying. And so, for example, at the very beginning of the Catechism, in number two, paragraph two, it quotes the whole of that passage at the end of Matthew's Gospel. So it says, So that this call, the call of Christ, should resound throughout the world, Christ sent forth the apostles he had chosen, commissioning them to proclaim the Gospel. Then it quotes that Matthew Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Strengthened by this mission, the apostles went forth. As I read that to a group of catechists, I changed one of the words... And I don't know how often you find yourself doing this when you're teaching. I often change a word I'm uncomfortable with. Now, I know we always talk about liturgical abuse. I don't know, I would never be a good priest sticking to the words. Because as soon as my mind doesn't really follow it, I switch it a bit. So I, I made it strengthened for this mission. The apostles went forth. Because I knew that God trains us and forms us for mission. That's the way I'd thought about catechesis and how I form people and then send them out. And one of the students said, actually, it doesn't say that. It says strengthened by this mission. Well, I thought, well, they haven't gone. If they haven't gone. How can they be strengthened by a mission they've not on? Do you see? So I thought I changed it to be what I thought was the way of doing it. Now, 
I did resolve this to my own satisfaction a couple of years later by really just focusing on why did I do that? What could that mean strengthened by the mission? They went forth. And I resolved it to my satisfaction, if you like, on a personal level by reflecting on the fact that my mother, as with many mothers, her mission, her mission was her family. Uh, my mother at that time was um, in her 80s, but she would constantly, when she phoned up, be saying, now dear, what should I be doing with my life? You see, because she'd raised four children, she'd been looking after my father who had Alzheimer's, and when he died, she kind of, she'd lost her mission. We'd moved out. So what should I be doing? So I thought, okay, I can see, I can really see that having a mission strengthens you. That was, that was a good insight to have got. And I lived with that for a while because I, I, um, it helped me rethink what I'm doing when I'm forming people. I, because I always think I'm trying to persuade catechists. I'm always trying to persuade people to become evangelizers. So I never think that what I'm doing is giving them the strength for their life. And in fact, when you do give somebody that capacity to be an evangelist or a catechist, you're giving them mission and you're giving them the very best mission. You know, so you're giving them the greatest thing. And my mother knew that and she wanted to hold on to that. I was actually with her a month ago. I was with her for 10 days until she died. And she was, she was saying, Lord, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? That was, that was in her last week of her life. She just lived for mission. Very nicely, because of that, she also, I know, thank you, it was a really beautiful occasion. She actually also said to me, dear, I have decided to stop organizing your life. <laughs> <coughs> I said, that's really good you've decided that, Mother. So, so that, there you are, mission, but isn't mission so important to us? So I really understood that. Do you know what I didn't realize till I took seriously Eucharist? Okay, Eucharist, Eucharist. Is what happens at the Eucharist? Okay, we, we call it the Mass, very, very rightly, because you're sent from the summit. Okay, you're sent, this is how the church understands, isn't she? And remember, if the church is, and the scriptures, the church is the interpreter of the scriptures, then this is the summit, this is the sending of the, the disciples from the summit of the faith. Okay? Ite missa est, okay? Send them forth. So they're strengthened by the Eucharist to go forth. Well, it, kind of everything makes sense. As soon as you see that one, because then it becomes the source as well, doesn't it? The source and summit. It's the source of their life. I'd already realized, lo, I'm with you always to the end of time. I'd already realized, you know, that's how the church sees, obviously, the blessed sacraments and the Eucharist in our midst. Christ remains with us. So we've already seen that's how she reads that. Christ always is with us. Um, baptizing them. Okay, sacramental life. Teaching them all that I have observed, I have um, commanded you. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Okay, what's his command? Do this in memory of me. I suppose I'd always thought it was the Ten Commandments mainly. I had never thought that he's coming out of the summit of his own life, the place where he offers his life. And that's the commandment he's giving. So teaching them to observe, I, I became very interested in that because uh, Christ is asking that you teach people to watch. You watch, you see, to observe all that I've commanded you. This seems to me, isn't this what you do in CGS? Then you teach people to watch all the time, to observe all the time what I've commanded you. And ob obse observance is also to do, isn't it, with the observance of the Lord's Day. It's, it's obviously a liturgical term, observance. Because we forget the commandments begin with God. Sometimes we always think of the commandments more concerned with our relationship with other people, but 
they're focused on, on the liturgy, aren't they? They're focused upon our worship. So I suddenly, I mean, it just makes sense. Once you begin to read the scriptures and the church's teaching together. And I suppose where I feel I still am is, I don't know how far away my mind is from that connection. Do you see? This is why, because um, I've been trying to write a book about liturgical catechesis, I was just saying, for several years now, and it's shifting all the time so much because I realize my mind is not yet Eucharistic. The phrase the Catechism uses, um, as well as source and summary, it quotes from St. Irenaeus. Um, our thinking should be attuned to the Eucharist. If you want to look it up, it's... Um, oh, here, I've given it to you on your handout. Oh, I haven't given you a handout. <laughs> There you are. Everybody look at that. So it's the first quote. That really will help you to have the handout I've prepared for you. So the very first one, there's such an incredible little paragraph. It's only two sentences I wanted you to have at the very beginning. 1327. So as you're, as you're receiving it, I'll just read it to you. In brief, the Eucharist is the sum and summary of our faith. Interesting is sum and summary. Sum and summary, two different words. Yeah, and I, and I really am very, I found that very important to remember the two words. It's uh, as Jesus said when he was feeding the 5,000, gather up all the fragments, yeah? So it's, it's, it's a sum, it's the, everything is gathered at this point. Eucharist doesn't replace our lives. So the Eucharist, it's not that we become Eucharist to the exclusion of anything. We don't focus in our catechesis on this one point and therefore not on other things. The Eucharist gathers everything else that we're trying to teach and brings it together. That's the... the assembly, so, is, the, is the assembly? Is the assembly in a, in a very abbreviated form for us, if you like, a manageable form, but it's the sum. In other words, all of the elements are in there. It's, it's just as you'd have, so we say the Our Father there, the whole, if you like, the focus of prayer is there. We have the creed there, don't we? So we have, if you think in terms of the catechism, part one of the catechism is the creed. Part four of the catechism is the Our Father. Part three is life in Christ, and that is, this is, is life in Christ, which is his graced life, which we receive. And it's all gathered, you see. It's all gathered in the liturgy. So it's a sum and a summary. And then there's that amazing quotation, I haven't given you the reference. Our way of thinking is attuned to the Eucharist. And I, again, I love that phrase because... It's like a fine tuning. If you've heard an orchestra tune up, when you get the first violin, everything tunes to the same pitch so that it can play together. And so it's more that when we're trying to think, how do we catechize? If we think Eucharist and if we think liturgy, we tune ourselves well so that our thinking gets settled. It's that. The Eucharist in turn confirms our way of thinking, which I haven't tried to think about at all. But maybe it's that once all the other elements, I imagine, are going to be reinforced and, and given sense and given their place when we have that. Okay. I use, so that's Matthew. I've kind of had a big breakthrough in Matthew's commissioning and catechesis, because the Great Commission is the, the passage people always use for catechesis. Um, you know as well, if we were to take other Gospels, so the end of Luke, the end of Luke is kind of obviously Eucharistic, isn't it? Everybody knows that one. So there's no, in a sense, you don't need to push people so far because they've already made those steps that the road to Emmaus follows all the steps, doesn't it, of the structure of the Mass. 
So we know that with Jesus' teaching. And then obviously evening comes. Okay, stay with us, Lord. Okay, I'm with you always. All of this, okay, and you break bread and their eyes are opened. So it's, it's obviously, this is the Eucharist. This is the point at which, and they rose. The word is used for resurrection, and it starts in. So they rose and went back to Jerusalem then. So they kind of get refocused on the center, and they rise in their resurrection life through the Eucharist. So that's the Lucan one. John as well, John once you realize that he's going to be following a Eucharistic conclusion like that, again, it's sort of obvious because, isn't it? Because of that, that great passage at the end where Jesus again meets his disciples on the shore and he's, he's got the fish. And so he's making breakfast for them. And we know that's kind of a Eucharistic symbol there. And we have Peter plunging into the sea. Plunge, okay? So we know what's going on there. So we've got the whole baptism theme leading to the Eucharist and to the risen Christ and then the feeding, feed my lambs and my sheep. And mission all comes out of that. So I haven't, I haven't looked at Mark and studied how Mark does it, but we can be sure that Mark, I think we have to say, especially with the long ending, because that's the canon, but Mark will be the same. It'll give us our Eucharistic, but it'll do it in another way. So we can see the whole thing. It's not narrowly Eucharistic. It's the whole of the liturgical life. It's the whole of the life of the Christian. It's the whole of our prayer life and our faith all coming together in the scriptures to make sense, to be mystagogia for us, to reflect upon the meaning of that. And why is the Eucharist so central? It's because it's, it's Jesus himself, of course. It's not anything other than I am with you. So this is Jesus, and we're reflecting on our life with him and how he is the summit of our life and the source of our lives. So it's very simple in a way. Okay. Let's just... Um, so where I'm going with this talk as well is the... Some other things that I found were connecting up for me. All of So the Eucharist gathers the scriptures. It gathers the faith around it. So we understand the, the different elements of the faith. The other thing that uh, the catechism really is trying to show us all the time is it has gathered our life around us, around the Eucharist as well. And so I want to spend time showing how the Eucharist is seen to be the gathering point for every dimension of our life and how the Catechism presents that to us. So that it's not just our minds being attuned, but our lives being attuned to the Eucharist as well. So, I've given the next quotation down following the stages of life. This is how the section on the sacraments uh, begins in the Catechism. I, it doesn't have the title following the stages of life, but they're the two paragraphs. So it just introduced the sacraments and the sacramental life. And you see in that first paragraph it says the seven sacraments touch all the stages and all the important moments of Christian life. The sacraments do that. If you want to put a, a note next to it of some numbers that you, you could read in the Catechism, 518 to 21. 518 to 21. This is picking up the language of that section, which says that when Christ came, he touched all the stages of human life. That's what his incarnation was about. And it uses Irenaeus again. Let's talk about that. It says he in himself recapitulated, so as the head summed up, it just means summed up, which is another summary thing. He summed up the whole history of the human race and every person's life. So when he became incarnate, because he's the head 
of the human race. In his life, he touches everybody's life. He united himself to every person in all the stages of their life. And then that's in 518. In 521 it says, therefore, what's the Christian life about? Now he's touched all our lives. It's that we should live his life. He did it so that we no longer live for ourselves, but so that his life becomes the source of our life. And we, it says, um, I'll give you the actual phrase. This is in 521. It says, um, we must accomplish in ourselves the stages of Jesus' life and his mysteries. And often beg him to perfect and realize them in us and in the whole church. For it is the plan of the Son of God to make us and the whole church partake in his mysteries. So, that, so that's what the sacraments are for. Jesus touches all the stages of our life so that we can live his life. And then he goes on, doesn't it? And that's back to our handout. Talks about certain resemblance between natural life and spiritual life. And then says that's why we're going to set out the sacraments in this order so we can really understand this idea of Jesus, I am with you always to the end of time. And it says it's not the only way to do this, but uh, it does allow you to see the sacraments are an organic whole. An organic means a living organism based on the idea that we are living persons. So think of the sacraments as serving our organic unity. And within this... Um, organic whole, the Eucharist occupies a unique place. As the sacrament of sacraments, all the other sacraments are ordered to it as to their end. There's just another word that I think becomes very helpful for us to think about in catechesis, is this idea of the end. Uh, so, you know, the Greek word telos, meaning the purpose, the point at which you're always driving. Because once you once you know where you're going with any teaching or any topic, you line up everything for that. Once you know, say with Catechism of the Good Shepherd, once you know as your children come in where you're trying to get them to, everything can line up. Nothing lines up unless you have the end clearly as, as the point to, to focus on. Then everything um, gets there. It's like traveling. Right, so that's the first, that's the first sheet. Okay. Now then, following that, I've given you a whole, just so you've got it to take away, this incredible passage uh, about liturgy, which I always loved before I understood a lot of the points about the connection between catechesis and liturgy and I'll just read it through so you can hear it and so that the camera's got it as well. So it's by Gregory Dix, The Shape of the Liturgy. I think he was the person who first sowed in my thought that the command that do this in memory of me is a command so that when Jesus speaks about his commandments this is the one that he's probably focusing on. But this is about how every single person in, Christ, in Christendom has aligned their lives to the Eucharist. This is actually, if you wanted to look at the history of the Christian faith, it's simply an aligning to, to the Mass like that and to liturgy. Was ever another command so obeyed for century after century? Spreading slowly to every continent and country and among every race on earth, this action has been done. Let's do this in memory of me. In every conceivable human circumstance. For every conceivable human need from infancy and before it to extreme old age and after it. 
from the pinnacles of earthly greatness to the refuge of fugitives in the caves and dens of the earth. Men have found no better thing than this to do for kings at their crowning and for criminals going to the scaffold. For armies in triumph or for a bride and bridegroom in a little country church, for the proclamation of a dogma or for a good crop of wheat, for the wisdom of the parliament of a mighty nation or for a sick old woman afraid to die. While the lions roared in the nearby amphitheatre on the beach at Dunkirk, while the hiss of scythes in the thick June grass came faintly through the windows of the church. Tremulously by an old monk on the 50th anniversary of his vows, furtively by an exiled bishop who'd hewn timber all day in a prison camp near Murmansk, gorgeously for the canonization of St. Joan of Arc. One could fill many pages with the reasons why men have done this and not tell a hundredth part of them. And best of all, week by week and month by month, on a hundred thousand successive Sundays, faithfully, unfailingly across all the parishes of Christendom, the pastors have done just this to make the plebs sancta day, the holy common people of God. Isn't this beautiful? It just really captures it, doesn't it, for you? This is, this is the way in which the church has received the Lord's command and just lived by it, by it. I won't read, you've got another beautiful paragraph after that. I saw that this is, this is the centerpiece um, and my mind had to shift a lot from the Baptist mindset into this to say that really is the way in which holiness comes about in our lives and is achieved day by day in the most common circumstances. And then I turned, this is, I've uh, given you here, do any of you know this poem by George Herbert? Yeah? Love by George Herbert. George Herbert, so he's a 16th century. Thank you. <laughs> You see, it's good somebody can read. There we are, that's good. Yes, thank you for giving me my own dates. <laughs> he was an Anglican, uh, he was an Anglican vicar at the time uh, and wrote this as, if you like, the sum and summary of the faith. If I just read through it, listen for Listen for baptism, listen for Eucharist, listen for cross and resurrection, listen for every element of the Christian faith being brought in here. And think of this as Jesus accompanying you on all the stages of life, which is really what it is. Love, so love is Jesus. Yeah. Love bade me welcome. Yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. So we've got, I mean, there's so many layers, aren't there, to, to what Herbert was trying to communicate there, but we've got the beginning of life to the end, to so the great heavenly banquet. We've got the whole movement from baptism to the Eucharist. We've got the, our creation and our recreation and our redemption. And we've got all the time, if you like, the personal call of Christ calling us all the time through his sacramental life to the Eucharistic table as well. So many things about this, but at the same time you can see a beautiful exposition of the personal journey, the stages of life, um, dimension of things. Okay. So, next little quotation. 
over the page. What are we doing for time? Okay, I've got the Eucharistic point of catechesis is not the title of this passage, but um, it comes from St. John Paul's Catechesi Tridende. And it's a very, very interesting statement here because John Paul is very concerned that um, nothing should be lost. Remember, again, the Eucharistic baskets. You know, everything should be gathered. We've got a sum here, which we must make sure none of the fragments get lost. So he says every disciple has got the right to receive the word of faith, not in mutilated, falsified, or diminished form, but whole and entire. So just think, sum and summary. Yeah? In all its rigor and vigor. Okay, think, think, just think of the, the Eucharist here. Why is this that we have to catechize so well and so faithfully? Catechesis is a, a servant discipline. It serves reality, that's all it does. And so when we catechize, all we're trying to do is to be attentive to what God has shown us and to, it's called echoing, isn't it? So it's echoing the voice of Christ. It's also echoing, and as it were, a reflection of what's there. I had a very good friend who was, um, well, she's still alive, who's a blind lady, who'd been blind from when she was about three, but she, she explained to me as she walks down any street, she can always tell where she is in the street because of the sound that her own steps make coming off every single building. So the echo, she can actually hear each one changing very, very slightly, which presumably we all could if we focused. And she's just learned how to know exactly where she is in terms of relationship to buildings like that. So kind of an echo is a catechesis is something which just takes account of all the reality you're trying to show. And the Eucharistic one then, if we're trying to attune ourselves to the reality of the Eucharist, you see all of this catechesis is for the sake of, in order that, that's the telos, the sacrificial offering of his or her faith should be perfect. It's really clear, isn't it? Again, and I, I hadn't seen it for a long time that John Paul is telling us that it is that Eucharistic offering which we make, don't we, in the Mass and which we where Christ joins his offering to ours so we can, it can be perfect. We need to be able to catechize so well on that offering of ourselves and of his offering so we understand what it is. That's why we need the word of faith presented totally fully so we understand all of the dimensions and all of, all of our faith is gathered around that. How do we make an offering of ourselves? Yeah. I just suddenly, I've always been troubled by the maxim that says be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. Yeah. And now I see that only the perfect offering that united with Christ is perfect. Yeah, and you, yeah, well done. That's, and the word is, is the word for telos, perfect. Just so you know. In Greek, in Greek, the word used here for perfect is the same word we've just been talking about for end, the point. It's have your, end have your yeah have your end directed to have the end in your life that the Father has in His, because when we say Thy will be done, which is our prayer, isn't it? We are simply say, what is the Father's will? The Catechism keeps on saying the Father's will is that all will be saved. So you have a, a, if you can make the will is the salvation of all, obviously yourself central to that. And then you make a, a perfect offering of yourself for that will. Yeah. Okay, so the Eucharistic point of catechesis. Uh, that's why we catechize for that. The catechism, as you know, and this is something I won't spend a lot of time on, but the catechism, I've moved so far on how I've understood what it was for. I had thought it was simply a large collection of beliefs, really assembled, but maybe assembled in any particular order, but I hadn't realized it had a telos. I hadn't realized it had a purpose. 
uh, and that the way in which it was put together was precisely to reflect upon the centre of the faith. Catechesis, the catechism is presented so we can make a sacrificial offering of ourselves. So everything in the catechism is serving the point of that. It's, it actually says it in the introduction, just had, you know, you have to read it and believe it. So number 25 um, is the catechism there says, um, the whole concern of doctrine and teaching must be directed to the love that never ends. That's, that's to this will of the Father. Whether something is proposed for belief, hope or action, the love of the Lord must always be made accessible so that anyone can see that all the works of perfect Christian virtue spring from love, source, and have no other objective than to arrive at love, summit. Remember what the Eucharist is called by Pope Benedict? The sacrament of love. This is, this is the, uh, the focus there for it. Number 23, I mean, you could just, once you see it, it's everywhere. It, because the catechism is not just a, a collection of things we read through to learn things, it is to focus us on how to make this offering. So number 23, the catechism seeks to help deepen understanding of faith in this way, it's orientated towards the maturing of that faith. It's putting down roots in personal conduct and in personal life and shining forth in personal conduct. The whole of the catechism is practical. It's for the sake of practice. See? Number 18, that was number 23. Number 18, practical directions for using this catechism. Big, bold title. The Catechism is conceived as an organic presentation, italicized for emphasis. Remember how it's, sorry, I thought you were, no, no, you're scratching your head, that's fine. Now it was number 18. It should be seen as a unified whole. This is the whole Eucharistic language we've just seen in 2010, 2011, 12, in that section on the handout that the, the Eucharist is this summary, this organic whole. The sacraments themselves form an organic whole themselves for the sake of this understanding. Anyway, there's so much, if you got me on the catechism and how it serves this. One thing I want to say, though, um, this, again, for me, was a great breakthrough because the, the catechism is, as we know, split into four parts. The four parts, as we know, reflect the very first verse in Acts of the Apostles which describe the life of the church. Acts 2, verse 42. And the four, so once they're, they're baptized, the disciples are devoted to, it's a very, very strong word, they're devoted to the apostles' teaching, that's part one, fellowship, that's part three, life in Christ. The breaking of the bread, it's part two, which is the liturgy and the sacraments, and the prayers, part four. So we've got the four parts from the very beginning. Yeah, no, that's Acts 2.42. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and the prayers. And they're the four parts. As the catechism explains the structure itself, it then does a number of things to help us think, how does that relate to your life? So in, there's an introductory section on the structure, 13 to 17, and it says, you can think of faith, hope, and love, and this is a very traditional way of organizing catechisms. You can think of it a bit like that. Part one, the, the apostles teaching the creed is the faith. That's what we believe. Part three is Love, the virtue of love, is how we live. And part four is the virtue of hope, because it's what we hope for, we, thy kingdom come. It doesn't mention part two. Isn't that interesting? I was very puzzled by that. Doesn't, why doesn't it mention part two? There are only three theological virtues, and we've got four parts. Doesn't quite work. See? <laughs> then... Um, in a very interesting essay 
called Sources of Faith, Cardinal Ratzinger said, another way, he said, I, I've said that the catechism is like a, a reflectional scripture. Think of the meanings or the senses, the spiritual meanings of scripture. So the scripture as we know, because the scripture is God's word to us, gathering up the whole of our material and spiritual lives, the scriptures themselves will be reflecting that in God's plan on all the different dimensions of who we are. And so the spiritual meaning of the scriptures, when um, you have what's called the allegorical meaning, which just means that everything is referred to Christ and, his, and the plan of God. He said that's like part one. It's like the allegorical reading of the scriptures. Then another meaning of scriptures is the moral meaning. It tells us how we should behave. Well, that's like part three of the catechism. And then there's the anagogical meaning. In other words, what should we hope for? So when you read the scriptures, they tell you that. That's like part four. He never mentions part two. Isn't it interesting? So it doesn't quite work, is what I thought. Then, of course, you know the transcendentals of the Christian life. Truth, part one. Goodness, part three. Beauty. The Catechism calls prayer the, light, the love of beauty. Philokalia actually uses that. It says this is the love of beauty, our prayer life. It doesn't mention part two. Except, which is the other transcendental? Is one. Okay, is, is unity, is oneness. You see, once you, once you therefore see, okay, of course, this is where all the meanings of the scriptures come together and they're proclaimed. This is where our faith, hope and love is through the creed and through the Our Father and through the work of grace is, comes together. This is where the transcendentals of truth and goodness and beauty come together into one. That's, that's how everything goes together. The liturgy is always the unifying point. As I say, it's never excluding anything, but everything we teach is orientated towards the liturgy. Bec why the liturgy? Because that is the life of Christ given for us in its fullness, in his fullness. Right? So we can join ourselves to his life. And there's one, I want to leave a bit of time for any questions. There's one last thing which I'll just, um, is on your hand out there. It's the other passages. Um, I have found this really helpful for, for catechizing in all areas is to follow the anthropological way of doing it the catechism has. So it's, it, it explains our, our nature as, a, as relational beings in the first part. In other words, he says, when we're established, when God made us, he made us as having four essential relations in our lives. Obviously, our relationship to God. Well, actually, it distinguishes the word relation from relationship because I have a relationship to my mother, and that could be good or bad. It can be disharmonious or harmonious, but I have a relation to her, once a mother, always a mother. She's my mother, even though my relationship may not be good, or it may be very good. So relation is unbreakable, relationship is what varies. And the Catechism also, it has another way of trying to explain that distinction between relation and relationship by saying image and likeness. It uses Irenaeus' his distinction, always made in the image of God. In the, in the image of Christ, the likeness to him is what could be lost and must be restored, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's how the Catechism tries to, again, just help you think through in terms of the persons of the Blessed Trinity. Kind of stability of my identity and also, Augustine said, we've gone into the land of unlikeness. That's the land of sin. We've lost that likeness. So Christ came to restore our likeness of the image. He's the image and to restore the likeness to the image. So you have, in terms of the four relations, you have relation to God, 
And the, the term for that, as we know, is original holiness. There's actually a term given to that. So whenever we say we're called to be holy, we're called to have that original relationship restored. That relation, the relationship must be restored. And that, after that relation to God, we're also established with three other relations. To collectively, the church calls that original justice. Original justice. There are three others. One is to each other. So God made them male and female. He made us in relation to others. So I can never just be on my own. He made me of the dust of the earth. This is my relation to creation. And also, he, because he's made us what the church calls the microcosm of all of creation, he's united the spiritual and the material in us. So spiritual and material come together, and that's a relation which can never be broken, but can be very disharmonious. How the two? Well, yes, as soul and body, if you like, or as spirit. Uh, the spiritual and the material. And that's, that can be disharmonious. And so those four, what happens, then it walks you through, if that's how God created us, at the fall, what happens is, because of the rejection of the fundamental relation of holiness to God, the, it says the relationship, I think I have put that on your sheet. Okay, this is uh, 400. The harmony in which they found themselves, thanks to original justice, is now destroyed. The control of the soul's spiritual faculties over the body, that's one relation, is shattered. The union of man and woman becomes subject to tension. Harmony with creation is broken. So there's kind of the relations. The relations are still there, but the relationship with each of them is bad, is impoverished, distorted, problematic. And all because of that first one becoming So then the Catechism says, okay, how does Christ restore our relation? How does he restore the relationships? So that was his purpose in coming. His purpose in joining himself to each stage was to the restoration of the image in us to its full and beautiful likeness. Here's another quotation. Human life finds its unity in the adoration of the one God. The commandment to worship the Lord alone integrates man and saves him from an endless disintegration. That first, in other words, the first relation to God himself is what most fundamentally defines us, and that needs to be restored first. Then the other relations come around that. If you go through the section on the liturgy, in the Catechism, it therefore says the liturgy is the work of the restoration of each of the relations. So it, it, it asks four fundamental questions. Who celebrates the liturgy? How is the liturgy celebrated? When is it celebrated? And where is it celebrated? And the way in which the Catechism answers each of those is to speak about, it. so who celebrates it? It's celebrated by the whole of heaven and earth. It's celebrated, this is our social reintegration in the fullness of all our relationships. How is it celebrated? Through signs and symbols and using creation, and creation now signifies all the things it should, and we learn the meaning of all things, and they're taken up into God's plan, and our relationship with creation is being restored. This is not just a one-off thing. We know that's all our life. Yeah? But we're teaching, we know the telos of where it's going. When is it celebrated? There's a whole, it basically says it's celebrated in God's liturgical time. It's celebrated in his time, which enables us to make a unity of ourselves with our spiritual faculties governing our bodily time. So if we put ourselves into liturgical time, think, think of it this way, that um, we do, because we do this a lot of times, any time I, I make a commitment, when I, when I agree to come and speak here, I made an agreement with myself, I would still be the person who said I would do that. I kind of agreed over time 
that I'm still going to be the same person. I'm not just going to change my mind. I'm going to be there. Obviously, the church really loves vows because vows, when made well, commit you over time. They allow you, especially if consecrated vows, they allow you to commit your time. Therefore, you make a unity of yourself. And everything comes into a telos and an ordering around your, your vows. Liturgical time does this to us all the time because God's, we're constantly placed into God's time where we find our unity. And it just explains how the liturgy does that for us all the time. It ties us into the liturgy. So, it's so beautiful the way the Catechism does it. It ties us into the liturgical year all the way through as the following of Christ's life and his life in us all the time. It co if we follow the liturgical year, it commits us to living in Christ's time. It's a huge thing for us, isn't it? Because we so are into secular time. But it, it integrates our lives through that spiritual commitment. And where, where is liturgy celebrated? Talks about how everything, um, and you'll have had all these talks I've missed, but you'll have had all this about sacred architecture and everything sacred has got an anthropological dimension, hasn't it? It refers, so the altar refers to the altar of the heart. And, you know, everything in liturgy is to enable us anthropologically to come together to worship God in spirit and in truth. It becomes serving, serves that. So this is the restoration as well of our union with God. You have to read through those sections on liturgy to see how beautifully the liturgy is seen as the gathering and the, and the healing of all of the disorders, in other words, in terms of those basic relations. So the Catechism is incredibly um, thoughtfully put together to enable us to make a sacrificial offering of ourselves with an explanation of how liturgy and the sacraments and God's grace through that becomes the source of our lives and the summit to which we're constantly focused. So I say this only because, I mean, I've been using this catechism for so many years. I, I do think as well we're not we're at such an early stage of really unpacking the catechism for people. Um, why I love what you're doing in terms of, um, I'm speaking about Catechism of the Good Shepherd, and I don't mean to exclude people, but I, I know a number of you are involved in that, is because you have a very strong gathering and telos approach. You, you, there's Montessori understood because she had such a strong Christian anthropology. She understood the needs for repairing the relations. And I think she understood how you begin your pedagogy, which means to lead the child, isn't it? it? So she understood a pedagogy for beginning somebody on a journey, which is orientated in the right way. It's beginning to serve those things. You're beginning to train the child to see their lives in those terms. It doesn't have to be conscious all the time, does it? You're not, you're, not, you're not saying this to the children all the time. You're now repairing your relationship with creation. But you're doing it. And looking back, that's actually what's happening. And I say catechesis in the church is for reflecting on God's work and his grace. And pointing it out to people and trying to explain it to people and trying to open that up for people. Shall we, shall we um, I'll say a glory be, then we kind of wrapped up my bit. And then, but then let's, let's have a discussion. We've got ten minutes before we have to go. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and world without end. Amen. All my prayers between England and America have got lost because they're, they're said very slightly differently. In, so I, when I came over here four years ago, I couldn't say the Holy Michael prayer anymore because it was all, we, devils wander about the world in England. They, they, they prowl around here. So <laughs> I was really embarrassed that a priest, when I went back from my mother's funeral, said, should we just say the Holy Michael prayer? And I made about five mistakes. 
and, and you just want to say, it's how the Americans say it. But uh, he wouldn't have understood. I forgot, yeah, and I also forgot how to say the, uh, the act of contrition. In, anyway, he had to say it for me. So anyway, so all sorts of things. <laughs> I've realized my prayer life kind of stopped as I had to try and make a decision. Will I say American versions or English versions? I'm trying to become American. That's why the glory be is different, you see. So that's just me explaining, all right, that's just me explaining why I stopped at one point. Right, any, any thoughts or questions or observations? Well, when you were talking about the liturgy as the ordering of our life, I remembered a child who um, came to the atrium and after every presentation he would go over to the work that we have, the liturgical calendar, where you put the uh, little blocks in for the 52 weeks according to the color. And, and he was a third grader, and that's like a very beginning kind of work. And I always thought, wow, he's... He's just not challenging himself, you know? And I wanted to move him along and someone, you know, was with me said, no, but he seems really content. He seems to be really involved in that. So at the end of the school year, we had a synthesis time and we asked each child to go get their favorite work and bring it and present why they liked it or what they got from it. And of course, he got the liturgical calendar. And he said, I love to do this work because it makes me see that God has a time and a place for everything. <laughs> And what's even more astounding is that when he was an eighth grader and he was leading some people through uh, the atrium at an open house, he took them to his favorite work. And I said to him, Matthew, do you remember what you said about this? He said, oh, yes. I love this because God has a perfect time and place for everything. <laughs> and it just, it, it, that has impressed on me so much how, you know, the spirit is the teacher. And that was his lesson. That is his forever because it was like you said. It. Sure, yeah, sure. This is this is the great strength of well, one of the great strengths of the method, isn't it? It's because you once you've got an insight yourself, nobody you don't have to remember it. No, no. and the uh, the other one is that the timelines, the history of the kingdom of God and the plan of God, both of them, like as you're telling all this, it just makes me weep because I'm like I know all this. Mm -hmm. But now I understand it so much deeper because it's all there and it's it's so clear that, you know, we talk about the bridges of, you know, the ant antique people and the inventions and how they're brought into the life of Christ at the moment of the incarnation and the death and resurrection. We, we show the children all the sacraments and they're full of light. Yeah. And then as the time progresses after Christ, everything is imbued with the light that leads us to the blank page of our present moment in which we contribute to write the story with God to bring about the parousia. These are parousia children. They always know sure. we're heading towards the parousia when God will be all in all. Yes. It's Eucharistic. Sure. One of the hopeful things I, I really find about the scriptures is that the disciples, especially around this period of the Eucharist and the cross and the resurrection, are always sleeping. You know, they're either being told they're foolish and they don't understand anything, or else they're asleep. And, you know, this whole constant wake-up theme is so strong in the Scriptures. Now's the time to wake up. But they keep... Yes, yeah, so I think the kind of lack of understanding, it can be a bit like not being awake to the media. That's what the children are getting, isn't it? That's what that child got so beautifully from that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yes. <coughs> This this was this was excellent. It makes me um, think of another way Ratzinger talks about these things. With regard, I'm thinking of this with, with regard to you. Uh, he talks about the Eucharist as covenant renewal, right? And he talks about this in relation, in terms of the Eucharist, in terms of the Last Supper, the New Covenant, universalizing the Sinai Covenant. Right? And he says, so for the Sinai Covenant, you have uh, the, re the restoration of right behavior, law, the training of the heart to desire the true good, ethos, and this is done by means of right worship. And these three draw Israel into covenant relationship. Right? Maybe, maybe you think of how he does that. Yes. So, law, ethos, and cult. Yeah. No, that's really helpful. And the covenant theme, the New, the new Testament, the New Covenant, um, 
is such a central one. I have a lot to learn here. I mean, I'm at a university where covenant theology is such a big thing. Obviously, through Dr. Bergsman and Dr. Hahn, covenant theology is the way they do present uh, everything. And uh, yeah, I feel there's a lot to catch up on there. Thanks, Thank you. I wanted to just share that I think what really drew me and my heart just into the kind of pieces was that I already was living with this uh, call or, you know, and desire to help little children come to Jesus. But when I saw the Eucharistic presence of the Good Shepherd way back, 30 years ago now, my, I just knew with my whole being that that was the talus for me, was to help children come to Jesus in the Eucharist. And that's what the catechesis helps us to do. And that's really the entire meaning of it from the get-go, from the time they enter the ancient of three. It's like a long-term love affair and preparation for that. And so I just wanted to witness it yeah. for myself. No, thank you for yeah, that. How much it's fun. Thank you. Just a question uh, of clarification. So you mentioned Montessori understood that because she had a strong Christian anthropology, yes. the repairing of relations or relationships? Oh, I should say relationships. Thank you. Well, yes, how would, should we say it? How should we say it? Because the relations, the, the point about the relations is you, can, you they're unbreakable in one sense, but they can be very... Um, the relationship is just a way of speaking about the, the quality or the state of that. So it's a little bit like, you know, I can deny I am a child of my Heavenly Father, but it doesn't mean I'm not. So, um, so it can be a... Now, I don't know whether we'd say that's a repairing the relationship or repairing of the relation. But as long as... I, and I don't think I've probably being consistent in the way I've spoken about that. But. I, think, I think you were just up to that point. And the only yeah. reason I'm asking is yeah. because I thought it was great. So I wanted to mm -hmm. make sure that I... Would. Sure. I, so, I, yeah. I mean, you're, you're not restoring the relation as though it doesn't exist. So maybe we should always say the restoring the relationship. Yeah, the healing of the relationship. But even announcing that there is the relation... Yeah. No, no. No, so people, I do not leave you orphans. People do think they're orphans. And they the, other, the yeah. other question just off that was, everything in liturgy is uh, something about anthropologically come together. What was, I just missed the end of Yeah, okay, no, because it was very rushed. <clears throat> <laughs> so the catechism essentially gives us a liturgical anthropology because it ba it's based on the healing of the person. Well, it's, it, we're made for relationship with God, with others and everything else. And it's liturgical in the sense, I know this, how liturgy will be transformed in heaven, that the reality of everything which is signified here will, will come into its fullness. Um, but we're made for that heavenly liturgy. Uh, so we've, and it's very explicitly, so it begins in number 29, I think, uh, by defining us as religious bonded beings because often you know people will say we're social beings we're you know we're political beings we're whatever but the definition of the person is religious that's how you how you understand identity because it's bonded bonded with God essentially yes um, in, I'm from Philadelphia and I'm just really struck because there's a place called Pennsylvania Hospital, which goes back to the beginning, like 17, whatever, mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin. And, and, and it's all dedicated to the care of the sick for Christ's sake. But I think what happened, maybe it's Masons, I don't know what, but there's a separation of the love of God and love of neighbor and love of the worship of God. And the, and the way that you were talking about how the Eucharist um, brings us into this worship of God with, and then kind of organically kind of sends us forth. Mm -hmm. It's something that we've really lost in our, in any kind of religious education that I see, uh, except what we're, I mean, I haven't seen a lot, but I, mean, I have seen some. I, I think it's really important to restore that understanding of love God, and then that comes out, like Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. I think, um, 
yes to that was brought out. It's just organic. It's like the true vine, mm -hmm. the fruit grows. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're sticking something on it or taking away that. And I thought you were really bringing that out beautifully. Yeah. I mean, the scriptures also do it through, through body. Um, so we have all these, um, as well as sleeping, it's very interesting at the judgment, isn't it, that people didn't recognize Jesus. Uh, and St. Paul, you know, when did we see you like that? So they don't recognize the body of Christ. Um, and talk, Paul talks about not discerning the body. And he means it, I think, in terms of the, the love feast at the times, in terms of how they relate to each other and discernment of Christ. And obviously all these sort of not recognizing Christ, even on the, um, the mountaintop there, some of them, they're worshipping, but some are doubting. The disciples don't see who he is. You know, there's, the disciples won't believe things. So not discerning Christ, not discerning the body, wake up to the body in all of the ways in which that's needed. Uh, and they are completely connected, aren't they? There's, if you just wanted... I'll give you a little paragraph on this one because it's got the three meanings of body put together beautifully. You know, um, Jesus' body, body of the church, body of Christ. Um, and it, it's always given me a kind of model of how we need to try and teach that. Um, okay, 2,617 has got how, now interestingly, this is, it says this is the contribution Mary makes in the church. She is the point of reference for ensuring that we have an understanding of Christ's body because she is the one who embodies Christ. She's there at Pentecost to embody, uh, to help the church embody the Spirit with her prayer and she at Cana helps Christ to embody uh, the, the wedding feast, the Eucharist. So it links together. Mary's prayer is always the prayer of embodiment. Say it again. Yeah, well, see, I found that really helpful for me because thinking, you know, about my mother as well, she's, it's, always in, it's always she makes things practical. She always helps you to see things, but she, she links things together for you. So she, it says here, Mary's prayer is revealed to us um, at three points. Uh, and this is what her prayer is always about. At the Annunciation for Christ's Conception, that's the body, his body in her. At Pentecost for the formation of the church, his body. And at Cana, uh, which is the sign of another feast, which is for his body and blood. So, so it links up the three moments of Mary's life as three times when she prays for the embodiment that we need so that we can see. Christ and receive him. Yeah, it's really helpful, I think. 2,617. Yeah. Friends, we come to the end of our hour. Let us thank our speaker.